Um, our, our last talk before we go to the closing keynote, which will be next door in track one, uh, which is, yeah, that way. Um, anyway, we have how to become a security partner and why you should. And, you know, um, I admire this person, just absolutely fabulous hair, fabulous person, fabulous everything. Um, give it up for Brienne. All right. Hello, everyone. There's me amplified. Um, yeah, this is great. This is only the second back in front of people talk I've done since, you know, the whole Panera thing. Um, I'm really glad to see you. I'm really glad you're here. I'm here to talk to you about uh, my job, but also other jobs like it and why you may or a little bit of may not want to do it. Uh, if you go to my Twitter or go to my blog, there are links to everything I'm going to talk about, including the slides. So feast on information and let's get going. So a little bit about me. Um, I took the long way into tech, spent a bunch of years as a writer and an editor before moving into infrastructure engineering, spent some time as a site reliability engineer, uh, got into security via enterprise security, and now I'm a security partner on the product security team at Gusto. And I'll mention, um, and this is you know, partially explained by the fact that I am standing here at all, I like teaching, I like explaining, and it'll be clear why that's important in a few minutes. Uh, I also have a UX background, which I mentioned in part because I think it explains how I approach some stuff. And furthermore, if you tweeted me animal pictures for me to look at during the adrenaline come down after this, you will have my eternal gratitude and I'll send you many emojis. Let's start with the important question though. What's a security partner? And it's a great question to ask because until my now manager wrote me on LinkedIn last May, I had no idea either. The short version that I tend to explain now is that I work like an internal consultant within Gusto offering security expertise to uh, product and engineering teams that need it. All right. What that means practically, though, I do a lot of work with internal teams uh, just to elevate their already really quite good security game um, and just educate them on the things they, knew they need uh, to know to make features securely. And I do a lot of work with product teams, too. I talk to a lot of product managers. Um, luckily, they're really fun people, so that works. And I do a lot of feature evaluation, which can be super formal, like, Hello, if you have written a report, there's a table, there are numbers in it that you cannot argue with. But it can also sometimes just be, we had a conversation and I'll bold some stuff in the notes so you know what's important and what to keep in mind as we go forward. And because I talk to so many people, I often end up contributing to or helping to create security policy. Um, I do a lot of work just with engineering and product leaders and that word partnering is gonna come up a lot as we dig into some other job descriptions in a few minutes. Because I'm talking to lots of different people, it's not rare that I'm the only security person in a meeting. So I end up, at least for short periods of time, sometimes being the voice of the security team, which I take super seriously. Um, luckily, I also think it's really fun. And then this is another one of those phrases that comes up a lot in job descriptions, but I think it's key. Going into ambiguous situations and determining what needs to be done. There are a lot of meetings where I know roughly what we're going to talk about. But before we start, I don't know what they need from me, and I don't know what the necessary work is going to be. And it's important to be comfortable with that. And it takes a little bit of time. So the work that I do can generally be divided into things that scale and are meant to scale and things that will never in a million years scale and shouldn't. Uh, the scaling stuff is things like writing documentation about issues that keep coming up. And the engineering teams that my team works with, uh, they have very good manners, and they keep having the same issue come up in multiple teams at once. So it becomes really easy to say like, oh, three different teams are asking questions about safe file upload. Sounds like it's probably time to write something about that. Um, I also do security education. All hands is a favorite place because that means we can get information out to several hundred people at once. Um, it's basically the best because it really gets the job done. There's also some work uh, maintaining internal security education tools. We do forks of OWASP tools. We've done some really cool stuff uh, with the inimitable juice shop um, for security awareness month. But more day-to-day, -day, we use Rails Goat uh, because we are a Ruby and Rails shop. And then this is a different kind of scaling, uh, distilling issues for higher-up folks, which are one-to-one -one conversations but end up bringing input from lots of different meetings in so that uh, the people um, further up in management than me get a quick sense of what's going on without having to have a 1,000 conversations. Things that will never scale, uh, that feature review, it's a pretty key thing to the job, and it's always just me and maybe one of my counterparts, and we go forth and um, take a look at what's coming up in engineering and see what we need to weigh in on. 
all of those conversations, talking to product managers, talking to engineers, those are just relationships that need to be built and it's not something that you can or should automate. There's also a fair amount of Slack surveillance. Um, I'm a very text-based organism, so this works well for me. And I just like to look around and make sure that before, you know, ideally if questions even come to security, we can pop in and say, hey, I noticed you're asking about a subject that's relevant to us. Let me offer you guidance. And then there's also looking forward. Uh, I get to look at a lot of like product maps and roadmaps and stuff like that. And I get to look forward and say like, hey, that thing you're looking at in five or six months, that sounds like a really different use of data than we've done before. Let's set a meeting as we get closer so that we can talk about how to do that safely so that uh, only good things happen. So a moment, and this is something I wondered about when I started getting into this job. Security partners and developer advocates, not the same job, but they share some DNA. So if you're interested in one, you might be interested in the other. So I wanted to just talk through that so you have a sense of both. Things like security partner work can be external. Hello, I am standing on a stage in front of you. This is about as external as it gets. But a lot of our work uh, ends up being much more internal and working with internal teams for things that will be built to eventually be in front of users, but not initially. Developer advocates totally can work internally, but a lot of what they're really best known for, and this is why you can often find them also on a conference stage, is working with users and doing externally facing things. Same thing, a security partner is working to elevate security practice internally. Um, at least at my job, we don't really do user education. We might try to demonstrate good security posture, but it's a little different. A developer advocate is best known for working to do, to increase knowledge, you know, in the path of adoption of just users, which could be docs, talks, code samples, well known for webinars, you know, stuff like that. In my job, we're looking to intercept colleagues' questions to answer, where developer advocates are really looking to answer user questions. We work on internal docs and training, dev advocates externally. And the same thing with document, documentation and training. We're just trying to address internal needs that come up, whereas the developer advocate is really looking for user stories to address with their work. From there, though, it gets way more similar. Um, both jobs benefit from a really wide swath of uh, technical experience. Uh, the more things you've seen and done, the more helpful you're going to be to the people who depend on you. And both of them, uh, if you like writing and talking, you're in a good place. Let's get back to the important stuff, though. What companies actually hire security partners? And uh, I think this is the first time I've had to do this for a talk of mine. A disclaimer, uh, I do not endorse any of the companies we're about to see. Um, appropriateness, ethical fit, and stuff like that is up to you. But my goal in looking around was just to get a sample of the job descriptions and opportunities connected to this kind of work so that you can walk out of here having a better sense of what's possible. Companies that hire security partners that I saw, and in looking this up, I realized that it's kind of like when you're looking for a new place to live, you don't get to pick from every place to live possible. You just get to see what's vacant at that time. So what I looked up, looked up kind of went beyond anecdata, but I wouldn't call it exhaustive. I am going to keep looking. LinkedIn helpfully sends me updates every day for 30 plus jobs for security partners, and they haven't sent me an actual one yet, but I'm going to keep looking. Uh, so Netflix, as part of their AppSec team, does security partner work. They've written some really good stuff about it, which I'll link at the end. Uh, Meta, better known as Facebook, because they are enormous, the security partner roles I saw are even more specifically focused. And we'll see a few of those as we uh, dive in here a little further. Um, Gusto clearly hires security partners, though we are not hiring right now. We're hoping to again by the end of the year. Found job descriptions for uh, both BetterUp and Marketa. I've heard that Atlassian and Slack do as well. Um, but this is not exhaustive. And the language gets really interesting. You know, like I mentioned, the well-meaning but unhelpful LinkedIn job dispatches. If you were to, for instance, look up Microsoft Security Partner, what you're going to find is third-party services super happy to partner with you to give you security for money. Um, similar with Apple, there is a job labeled Security Partner, uh, partner, but it's not quite the same. So they do exist. They're not super plentiful, but I get the feeling that they're emerging. And um, yeah, I've gathered some that I link at the end, and I'm just going to keep adding to that as I see them. So with that, let's look at how the role differs from company to company. And all the phrasing here is verbatim from job descriptions that I read, just to give you a sense of how this stuff is being talked about. And so some common things, stuff like partnering with engineering and uh, product leaders, like I mentioned, um, delivering security training, the scale of which varies from job to job, um, solving complicated business and security problems, which gets into kind of that ambiguity again. You get the sense that they really want to hire someone to 
to fix their difficult stuff. That comes up pretty frequently. Um, discovering means because sometimes when you're in security, kind of like in usability, people are asking one question, but their real question is actually hiding behind it, maybe behind a few layers. You know, bringing the human touch to enabling the business through security, like they really want a nice person to speak security at people who really need to hear it. And this last one, we'll use it later. Yeah, <sighs> experience with threat modeling. That is the one specifically technical skill that I saw come up in all of those job descriptions. And yes, Kat on the stage yesterday did a great talk about it. If you want to dive in, um, check it out when it goes live, because I sat here in the audience going, yes, exactly this, because it's key and it's so important. Uh, so the things that varied, years of experience, you know, in the way of tech and security, like people love to name a number and have it have meaning. It, it kind of doesn't, like don't let it stop you. Uh, mostly just indicates whether they want someone who's kind of senior, maybe not so senior. The focus, of course, varied a lot. You know, is it AppSec? Is it compliance? Is it acquisitions? Is it something else altogether? Usually they laid that out pretty well in the job description. And then the approach, which often but not always ties to seniority. Are they wanting someone to come in and like just lead organizational change, or are you just contributing to what's already going on? Let's look at some specific job descriptions, though. So these two are both more senior. Um, the first one starts out very typically, you know, 10 years of information or experience in information security, like, you know, why not 20 years, 25 years, lots of years. But it does specify that they want experience across security disciplines. And with that, like, I believe them. They want you to have done some different stuff. It will benefit you in this job. And here's more of that communication and relationship stuff. You know, can you relate risk to senior leadership, which is a really particular skill? Can you relate risk in a way that people who just want to see numbers related to money have it be meaningful to them and, you know, spur them to some kind of action. The next one, you know, relationships with stakeholders and business leaders. Can you speak to people, make them understand, and actually have them listen to you across time? And this last one, green dot, um, I like that in particular. The ones where the job descriptions got really specific to me is a different kind of open door. Because for instance, I do not have audit and data protection experience, but you might. And if you can also say, hey, I have lots of experience dealing with business leaders, this might be a way to get them to call you back, even if you don't have you know, the exact list of experience they're asking for. So let's look at the next one. You know, five plus years of experience, yeah, all right. And again, specifics like international security and compliance, auditing, public policy, business development. This is all stuff that you're more likely to get familiar with in another job but it means that if you apply to it, someone's eyes are going to light up or you know, in the bleaker dystopian version of things, the automated system that scans your resume will go, oh, hey, I saw an audit, let's talk to this person. So it gives you a possibility that might not otherwise exist. The second dot I, I liked because uh, they specifically call out certs. Uh, I do not have certs. They seem like a great way to get experience if you can't convince someone to pay you to get the experience. But what they're specifically saying is there's this thing you can do separate of work that they will recognize as applicable, and that's a thing that you can pursue. Um, so the last one I thought was funny, uh, bachelor's degree or 10 plus years of experience. Um, I have a bachelor's degree. It is in writing and publishing. And somehow I think they're probably not gonna consider that specifically equivalent, but you know, they should have been more specific. So let's look at two more. The first one I liked because half of it is just uh, experience from being a dev, you know, hands-on development in a popular programming language, or infrastructure as code tooling experience like Terraform or Helm, AWS fundamentals. So they're looking at someone who probably has hands-on experience having been a software engineer of some kind. After that, they go into, you know, courting security initiatives, cross-functional settings. Can you talk to lots of different kinds of people? And after that, familiar, you know, familiarity with application security, specific tools, and the last one gets back into dev stuff, like have you touched CI, CD before? You know, this is experience that you can pick up in a regular software engineering job. The last one I liked because they did very specifically say they're looking for someone early. Like, no, it is not entry level, it's two to five years of experience, but it becomes more attainable and I appreciate that they're doing that on purpose. Uh, strong application security background, providing practical technical guidance to engineering teams, that's pretty close to what I do. And then the last one gets a little more Varied uh, threat modeling, of course, design reviews, architecture, and then pen testing and bug bounty handling. You know, all skills that you can pick up at a few different kinds of jobs. The stuff that I saw come up over and over, though, always some kind of call for tenacity, which is a really nice business-friendly way of saying that sometimes this job's a pain in the ass. 
which it's good. They should tell you that ahead of time. You should be prepared. It's okay. They tend to say it as, you know, exceptional grit, you know, that comfort operating in ambiguity. They're saying that there are just going to be days where you're kind of on your own, and it's better to know that up front. Always the emphasis on being able to talk to lots of different kinds of people, you know, bridging the gap between very different teams, strong presentation skills, stuff like that, and then working with lots of different kinds of people, which is putting that communication into action, building deep relationships and acting as a liaison. This comes up every time. So if this sounds like you, and more importantly, this is work you actually enjoy doing, there could be a place for you here. So let's turn back to anecdata and specifics. Um, I'll talk about my job a little more. In another era, I would have had a coworker take a picture of me presenting in person at work, uh, but you've probably seen enough Zoom grids to last you the rest of your life, so instead you get me at B-Sides a couple of months ago. Things that I do. Um, I put meetings first because it is important that you know this if you're considering diving into this work. If you get bummed out when half your day is meetings, you're gonna have a hard time at this job, and that's okay, it's just self-select out. That's what we do all, you know, when we read job descriptions. But yeah, I talk to product managers all the time. I regularly interact with engineers. I'm not working, but I still saw a couple uh, engineering product messages come in on my phone earlier. And people across security, we are constantly consulting with each other to figure out exactly what's going on and try to find patterns. Those feature reviews, code reviews happen a little less because we do try to get in at the design phase whenever we can. Um, we will pop in on people's PRs, but generally we consider it things not working ideally. There's that Slack surveillance. Um, my team, because I work at a more medium-sized company, uh, we are the ones who oversee our bug bounty program. And those are really cool days when I get to go and verify a report and then get to work with the team who's responsible for that code and you know, see it through to completion. That's really fun. Uh, for the documentation, perhaps you two have been the person who's been at a company where the documentation is kind of sad and neglected. Congratulations, you can own it and make it not suck. Uh, this is not for everyone, but I really love it and it's a really thrilling part of my job. There's a fair amount of leading training. Uh, we do we're responsible for Security 101 and monthly onboarding, just did that on Tuesday. We do monthly secure code training and other stuff that comes up. And then one of my favorites is the, the uh, opportunity and excuse to do research on all kinds of stuff. Hey, can you help me with the secure implementation of this particular AWS product? Hey, can you talk to me a little bit about this weird behavior in Ruby and Rails and how to be careful with it? Or, hey, you know, my webhook is not getting through Cloudflare. Can you see what that's all about? Let's turn back to you, though. What are different ways that people can come to this job? And in the way of InfoSec and Tech, um, there are many, many, many paths. These are the ones I've just seen firsthand. There is, of course, the traditional, hey, I went and got a degree in computer science or cybersecurity, and now I am a security partner. You can be totally effective that way. Um, same thing as we saw in that one job description. You're a software engineer. You wind up security inclined. You pick up some AppSec. Bam, go become a security partner. Other security roles are really interesting in that way, too. Um, my counterpart on my team, it lets her bring something really cool to things that I get to learn from. Totally valid. And then, as you might guess by all of the relationship and communication kind of stuff, maybe you're a technical person who happens to be the person on your team that you notice folks on other teams gravitating towards when they want an answer they'll understand on the first time. If you have ever been that person, this might be the job for you. But more specifically, besides qualifications, besides experience, why might you actually want this job? These are some of what I consider the perks about what I do from day to day. The work is super varied. Um, I don't know about you, but the, the pandemic kind of destroyed my long attention span. So getting the opportunity to just hummingbird between things, stellar. If your brain has also kind of turned into Swiss cheesy kind of sad sponge, maybe that's excellent. And projects change frequently, too, because I end up usually popping in on the design phase, and then once I have given people what they need to know, it's time to move on to another one. There's that owning documentation and education. If security documentation is bad, I get to fix it, and that is a tremendous opportunity. If you like changing context, maybe you have whole days that are very computer-focused, and then you have others where you're just talking to people all day, that is absolutely something that can happen in this job. Um, I usually tend to schedule all of my meetings early in the day so that I can actually do my thinkier work later, and that's something that this job really supports. If you enjoy enabling other teams to succeed, just coming in at exactly the right time to say, hey, I got that answer to that question you had, 
and this is the thing that's going to let you proceed with this feature that you've invested so much time in and feel confident that it's not going to turn into a security nightmare in four months. This job allows that too. And also, it's a really nice excuse just to be friends with people across engineering. Um, also relevant, uh, I tend to really like engineers. I like technical people. I like nerds. Not all of us are nerds, but enough of us are. And it gives me the chance just to go and pop in and just get to be friends with people across the company, which is not guaranteed in this era. It's a lot harder when you're remote. Just as important, though, there are reasons why someone really might not enjoy this job. One of them, and this is key, is um, if you need to code a lot to feel like an engineer, whatever that definition is for you, this could be tough. Uh, I do code as part of my work, but I'm not shipping features. Um, mostly it's just that I'm kind of stubborn. I make it known what I want to do on my team, and so lately I've been getting to dive more into Terraform. Super fun, but if you really like doing you know, multiple PRs per week, this is probably not your gig. Same thing if you really feel the need to stay with a single project from start to finish. That's just not really something that happens. Um, Storylines you know, will pop up a couple months later because there's a, you know, another question about implementation. But generally, you're not there from inception to shipping. You just get to see a notice for it later, and you're like, oh, you. And this is another big one. And I guess because I've, I've mentioned it to people and seen the different ways they react. If you do not like explaining the same thing more than once, you are going to be very bummed out at this job. Um, there are no, excuse me, there are very few really new security problems. There are just new places that they pop up. It is whack-a-mole, and often the moles are the same like four or five things. So if the idea of having to explain yet again, we use this form library, and this is cross-site scripting, and this why, why we need to care about this, if that sounds dreary, don't do this, because it's a big part of it. It's just there's always a new audience and a new need and a new feature to, add, to give insight to. Um, yeah, if you'd rather execute rather than planner, planning or optimizing or teaching, this would be rough. And also if you, you know, some people do prefer just like a really finite number of people to work with. I do have a, you know, I have my own team. We see each other at least twice a week. We work together. But the majority of my time, if you do by like surface area of my calendar, if you look at it in a given week, I'm talking to other teams. And if that doesn't sound like something you would enjoy, yeah, this one might not be for you. But mostly I just want to leave you with something hopeful. Uh, the thing I like about security is that if you are willing to put the time in and learn stuff, there's absolutely a place for you. And this is what I hope is just another place that you could possibly envision yourself being, another place where your skills and particular strengths, which actually are unique, could be needed and could really give other people something. So if this sounds good to you, um, please check it out. Ask me questions. I'm around all weekend. I'm on Twitter. So yeah. Hopefully um, you just found, you know, saw another door open and thought, maybe. It would not be a security partner talk without a page of links and resources at the end. Um, and everything here is linked both on my blog and at Twitter. Uh, the first thing, I wrote a post for Gusto, my first Gusto engineering blog post that's more specifically about my job if you want to know some more details. The sample job descriptions I corralled into a Google Doc for you to peruse later. Um, Reinventing Cybersecurity, the editor of which is sitting over there has a chapter for both me and my security partner counterpart at work, Carla Sun, that talks about these kinds of themes. Uh, my B-Sides talk is all about documentation for a specific audience, which is super intrinsic to this work. And the, net, the uh, two Netflix posts are super worth reading, too, if this is a job that's of interest to you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? If there are, please step up to the mic. We have just a couple minutes. We have, oh, there we go. Hi, hello. So it looked like threat modeling was pretty important. Are there any other just crucial skills you'd recommend trying to acquire if you were gonna try to get a security partner job? <sighs> basically just some kind of technical experience that will let you relate to other teams. Um, like I had a relatively short career as a full stack engineer. What was it like six months altogether? You know, um, which, you know, not a ton. I've spent more of my engineering time dabbling in infrastructure, but if I hadn't done that and seen how it's constructed, um, if I didn't have a sense of, you know, just how CI CD works and how code actually gets shipped and how deployments work, I could have picked up that information somewhere else. It just would have been a lot harder. So, 
Yeah, just basically kind of any technical skill that you can bring into that's relevant to the people you might be working with, that would be worth pursuing if you're trying to do this. All right. Yeah, the biggest thing is really being able to explain stuff. Um, I don't know, a big thing that I've done is uh, tried not to lose my ability to talk to non-technical people. And um, my partner is really nice about this. He has heard me talk about AWS and servers for hours as I try to make it make sense to him. And he'll just go like, no, not yet, try again. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that, if you have a person who's willing to do that, uh, reward them in, in food and whatever else you can give them because it's really, really, really useful. Like just being able to shift gears um, is critical. See, that tip itself, just like, wow, okay, I never thought of that. I yeah. need to find like super non-techie friends and say, okay, let me see if I can explain this yeah, and see ones, if it works. The ones who are like, nope, jargon, try again. All right, you're right. That was another acronym, uncool. Did you move near the mic? Because you have a question. So uh, you mentioned that you do like a monthly uh, security code training. Mm -hmm. So what is that like? Oh, um, that's fun. Yeah. So my company will have like an internal security uh, secure development guideline, but I feel a lot of times like some developers they are not aware of it or they are not actually like reading that carefully. So I was curious. Okay. I mean, I can talk about our version of it. Um, Every module we have focuses on a specific vulnerability, you know, cross-site scripting, um, server-side request forge, forgery, stuff like that, and just walks through an exercise through that's done on an intentionally vulnerable web application, which you know there are lots of them, ones for every language, and introduces people to it, and then just has gradually more specific hints. You know, hey, did you consider looking in the URL? What's that parameter do? Hmm. You know, all the way to like just type this just type this, we're going to get you to get the flag, we just want you to understand. And so it just walks people through it. So we just, we do that once a month, and it's something that we can do in greater depth, but mostly we just keep an open forum. And we do a lot more of it during Security Awareness Month, which is really fun. Yeah, thanks. All right, great job. Thank you again. Fabulous. Fabulous.